Wesley Johnson, you've just published a book on the Belfast Urban Motorway, kind of telling the tale of big roads in the, in the city of Belfast. But, I mean, we're very familiar, I guess, today with the M1 on the West Link and the M2 and Lagan Bridge and things, but that wasn't the original plan. Yeah, back in uh, the early 1960s, there was a developing plan to build a much more elaborate ring road around the city centre, uh, and that was uh, came about because traffic levels in the 1960s were soaring at a, at a rate that far exceeds the, the rate they're growing now. So, and then this came to its zenith in 1967 when there was a plan to build a fully elevated three-lane motorway entirely encircling Belfast city centre. So right the way around, high in the air, mm-hmm. three lanes, kind of six lanes, that would, have, I mean, that would have transformed the, the look of the city, never mind the transport in the city? Yes, it would have been very visual, um, especially in, at the junctions, for example, around York Street, there would have been flyovers perhaps more than 20 metres up in the, up in the air. Um, it would have it meant that the city centre area was much more accessible to cars, probably would also have brought about a lot more congestion because of that very same phenomenon. After 1967, it was divided into phases, and the first phase was the, the western flank, and it actually got approval, and it even construction even began, but construction had to stop again very quickly because of the troubles. It wasn't really possible to do construction on the site at that time, and uh, due to money, public pressure, changing opinions about roads, all meant that when the western flank eventually did get built, it was downgraded to a dual carriageway with roundabouts, which became West Link. And then in the 1990s, the northern flank, the Lagan Bridge, was built. And it was built actually very similar to what it would have been had it been uh, part of the urban motorway. It was elevated three or four lanes wide across the bridge. And what we're kind of missing is a, a huge stretch which would have kind of come around Ormo Park, Ormo or Embankment, coming around to kind of meet Broadway pretty much again. So we, right. kind of, we missed that. The, that the rest full of the circle, look. yes. Uh-huh. I mean, the, the plans, even as they were, had a huge community cost, um, mm-hmm. a human cost. It talks in the book about a community severance. Of effectively, streets were cut in two by what mm-hmm. became the West Link going through the middle of it. There are relatively few left, right, east, west streets left That's across right. the West Link. Yeah. I mean, it really changed communities. Lots of housing gone, lots of businesses gone. Yeah. One, one thing we have to remember is that the urban motorway was part of a wider regeneration scheme. So a lot of these houses were slum houses, and at that time there was support in those communities for rebuilding their houses. But what they objected to was them being rebuilt in different locations, and especially as high-rise flats, which is what was proposed. So a lot of these streets and houses were destroyed, not just for the urban motorway, but also for these ill-fated regeneration schemes. One of the rationales for raising the road above ground level was to reduce severance because you could then go between it at any point underneath. That eventually didn't happen because the, the visual and noise of that was so great that in the end they decided that suppressing it below ground level was better. But suppressing below ground level has the side effect of increasing severance further because you have to build a bridge every time you went across it. And there are many streets that existed in the 50s and 60s which are gone today because West yeah. crosses over them. It's one of, just one of the consequences of and it. Yet if we look at the book, you can, you can kind of see the, the two halves of the roads and you can imagine that's the bit right. that's missing. Just, yes. and, and those are kind of, a lot of them are still there today. Because in the book, I, ha- I have a map which shows the particular streets that were there and highlighting all the ones that are severed now. There's a strong argument that kind of nearly says that the construction though, of the roads through Belfast were really for the benefit of middle class commuters who had cars mm-hmm. and at the expense of working class residents who mm-hmm. tended not to have two thirds of them didn't have cars in, in, in those days mm-hmm. and actually this wasn't a very fair scheme. It was one of the main criticisms of the Belfast Urban Way was yes exactly that, gentrification that it was the middle classes doing something that the working classes were being asked to pay for um, and you know whether it was intentional or not I think that was the outcome um, and, and I, go, I, I go into this in detail in the book because the, the urban motorway, by definition, helped people who had cars, and the cars were generally the middle class people. Whereas the road was situated in the central area of the city, and the central area of the city was where the working class housing was. Yes, we didn't knock down a lot of semi detached houses in the Mother no, Road to do correct. this. Correct. You know, kind of partly because there weren't very many in the city centre, and partly because those that were tended to be in the regeneration areas, which is where the motorway was deliberately sited. Um, it, it was clearly pitting two socio-economic groups against each other. And when you get to the public inquiry in 1977, that's basically one of the intractable issues, is the fact that you know this isn't just a transport debate. This is a 
you know, a, so, a, a social debate as well. Mm. I mean, as you've been researching the book, um, there's 230 pages. It's, it's illustrated. Nearly every page has kind of colour diagrams mm-hmm. and maps and designs of how, how things were going to be built. So, our, some archive information was obviously still around from those days. 50 years later, some of it survived. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's sad that there's a tremendous amount of archive material that has been lost over the years, but. Some material has survived. Um, road service themselves were very helpful, and I was able to get quite a lot of pictures of construction of the West Link from that. But also from newspapers at the time, p- political organisations, and also individuals I've been able to contact with. I've been able to get a surprising amount of archive material, which is really fascinating. It took so long for it to happen. We went through kind of 20, 30 years of actually thinking about it before the plan was revised and revised and revised, and then mm-hmm. some of it started to happen. That's right. Um, and I guess even in my lifetime, the Westlink has changed at least twice. Mm-hmm. This is one of the inevitable things that actually our transport infrastructure, it looks very concrete. Yeah. And yet actually every 10 or 20 years we, we redo it, we yeah. tweak it. And Absolutely. Because um, Westlink was built in the 80s by people in the 80s for the problems of the 80s. And it was fair enough at the time. But now this is the, the 2010s and we have to make sure that our infrastructure meets the needs of the 2010s and that is going to be the case in the future. In 50 years time it will be our uh, children who determine what happens to these roads and it will be based on what you know, they believe is important at that time. So it's always any, changing. Do you have any predictions of where that might go? I mean, what are, the, what are some of the things around the corner for Belfast? I mean, we, we haven't finished building roads, have we? Uh, no, I mean, w- one of the fundamental points here to make is that the, the Belfast Urban Motorway probably was needed in function, and I think it was correct to build Westlink in function. The debate is more around its form and how it was built. So it's, it's not that it was wrong to build it, it's more just, you know, the debate is around exactly how it looks and the severance effect it has had. So moving forward, I think that's going to be the continuing theme. I think we are now aware that it's not going to be really possible to allow more people to commute into the city centre by car because I think it's now established that the city centre is at capacity. Mm. So if we're going to facilitate further transport in the city centre area, we can't really be doing that by facilitating cars. That's not to say that cars don't have a place outside the city centre because I think they do, particularly in a province like ours which is very rural in nature. Um, and I think it makes sense to facilitate car transport outside the city centre. So that's going to be the boundary, I think, is going to be the city centre versus the rest of Northern Ireland. Does this call for a proper joined up private car public transport policy, which is sadly missing most of the way through the book? You know, you, you referred mm-hmm. to the fact that the investment in public transport was kind of minimal um, for a long time, and then yeah. suddenly we kind of got a uh, York Road to Central Station kind of arrived, um, yeah. and then a wee bit more investment in buses, but actually mm-hmm. it took a long time for that to happen. It did. I mean, the, the the West Link was constructed during the Thatcher era and during the Thatcher era there wasn't really any appetite in government for public transport. It was felt really that public transport was just there for people who hadn't made it in life. This was before the whole global warming thing came in. I think we now have different rationales for, for public transport, practical and um, environmental. And I think actually there is a realisation within DRD now that a, you know, a more of mixed strategy is, is the only way forward. Do you think there's much mileage? I mean, we're sitting talking in East Belfast, and certainly since I started blogging, there's been talk of rapid transit systems up and down mm-hmm. the Ard Road, and, mm-hmm. and then people going, but where would it fit? So we'll take the Greenway. Oh, no, you can't take the Greenway. It's doing a very good job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, you know, in the next 10 years, could we have a, a, a rapid transit system that actually worked? I think rapid transit is going to happen because um, the first three phases of it are out to tender currently, and I would expect construction to get underway on parts of it. Um, within the next year or two um, and I think that the idea of having it in place you know, by say 2017 is quite realistic. Now there is going to be a lot of media attention I would say particularly on the Newton Arch Road because it's part of the strategic road network when this is introduced because it's going to have the capacity of the road. Because it could be you'll have one, one lane will exactly. be dedicated towards a, tra- a tram like, train like yeah, thing. Exactly. Like, whatever it is. So it's going to um, cause a lot of traffic problems initially. Now the gamble is that enough people will switch to public transport using rapid transit to compensate for that. And I think that's a courageous gamble and um, I actually support them trying it. Now whether it works or not we'll have to see, but I think it's worth trying. The fact that they're ending both the east and the west end of rapid transit at large park and rides is definitely the correct way forward because people are, are going to be driving to these places because they, they live all, in all sorts of places. You can't have rapid transit for every home. Yeah. The urban motorway was originally the ring road. 
you think there was ever really a chance that they would have got the whole thing built? I mean, they never kind of predicted a lot of traffic would go around the southeastern yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, and yet, it, you kind of wonder what would it have done for the Orma Road? What would it have done for Strambolus? You know, it could have really changed yeah. the character of those places in terms of industry and business. It could have. Yeah. The the urban there, there's just, there's sort of a phenomenon called the induced traffic effect, which is that it, if you provide a road, then it not only caters better for traffic that's using it, but it also allows more people to make the journey. Uh, that's usually seen as a bad thing, but it, it can also be a good thing because it facilitates more travel. But th- the traffic figures that we have seen since the urban motorway was planned are such that I think the urban motorway probably would have become gridlocked before the millennium, simply because of that effect. So I think it, it probably would have you know, reached the point we're at now anyway, even with providing it. So you do have to ask whether or not, if it, if it reached the same point anyway, it would have been worth all the destruction of actually constructing it. So there are kind of nuances to this then, I'm kind yeah. of detecting that you don't just add another lane or another two lanes onto every mm-hmm. road because you're pretty much guaranteed you'll fill them. That's you, have right. to, you have to change people's behaviour rather than you do. just so, let the road soak it up for 10 years. That's right, and you also need to be careful what, who exactly you're facilitating. The, the most recent Westlink upgrade, one of the main rationales was to facilitate port traffic, but because all the lanes are allocated to all vehicles, it also facilitates commuters which sort of disadvantages the public transport side of things a wee bit, while also advantaging the port. Um, and there were arguments, I guess, during the extension to say that people wanted like one lane dedicated for that's right. buses and, and lorries yeah. and things. There was a, there was um, a plan that one lane, it was a, sorry, a suggestion that one lane could be used for freight only. I actually think that idea has merit. It's something that could still be considered. It would be difficult to implement it on the canyon section of Westing because it's only two lanes wide and having HGVs in the right-hand lane with cars going faster than them in the left lane isn't the safest. But it's something maybe our generation after us may well revisit. Yeah, you think, I mean, the Westing, like, it could go three lane the whole way if somebody was brave enough to want to take down the walls and actually build new ones. Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible. You could. I mean, the land is there to widen Westing, but I think if you were going to do that, you, you 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 would have to justify it by allocating the extra lane to something specific. I don't think you could just make it another general traffic lane. I mean, you've kind of changed my commute um, every day down the kind of West Link now that it's no longer this kind of like traffic jam that I mm-hmm. wish I wasn't in. But now yeah. there's, there's lots of stuff. You can kind of become a West Link nerd nearly as you read the book mm-hmm. and you're kind of looking for the railings that are yeah. kind of doing things and how things have changed and the up and mm-hmm. down kind of undulations of the road are mm-hmm. kind of amazing because you don't realise yeah. just how bumpy it is yeah. uh, when you're going down. How did your interest in kind of transport? I mean, you're kind of a, definitely a transport geek when it comes to, <laughs> to Northern Ireland. But I mean, oh, well, where do, how did that develop? Tra- transport interest in transport runs in the family. My father um, is very interested in railways and buses, and has written books on them. Um, for me, it began with looking at maps. I collect old maps, and when you look at old maps, you see lots of things that raise question marks, like the Ballymena Bypass. Why is it sitting in the middle of nowhere called M2? You know. And I started investigating this, and I discovered all this fascinating history. And um, investigating that, I got interested in what's planned for the future, and I started a website about what's planned for the future to tell other people. And I discovered there's loads of other people here interested in this as well. And I just also think that civil engineers, um, as a breed, are very unsung. You know, we all, every day, we flush our toilets, we drive on roads. Everything we do is based on the work of civil engineers. And I think sometimes, you know, we're not really that grateful for what they've provided for us, you know, so I just also, you know, I just have a real appreciation for the work of civil engineers and and what they've actually achieved in Northern Ireland. Okay, well, in the book, you've certainly connected civil engineering with kind of social policy (laughs) um, and the effect of civil engineering, uh, you know, positively and negatively, I guess, on our our lives. The Belfast Urban Motorway, it's um, published by Colourpoint. Uh, It's available in all good bookshops and and online. Mm -hmm. Um, Wesley, thank you very much for your time. Thank you all.